Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our webinar, A Technical Dive into Creating Accurate Digital Terrain Models. My name is Jody Lee, and I will be the moderator on this webinar. I'm excited to be joined today by Joe Mustovi, photogrammetrist at Harris Geospatial Solutions. Joe has more than 20 years' experience in the geospatial industry, including postgraduate work in photogrammetry, remote sensing, and GIS. Joe is part of the geospatial production team, producing and ensuring that products undergo vigorous QA and QC testing in a stereo viewing environment before being delivered to our customers. So welcome, Joe. Thank you. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. I've muted the phone lines for all attendees, so if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, feel free to enter them into the questions chat box, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. We are recording this presentation, um, and we'll have it up on our website at www.harrisgeospatial.com in the next couple of days. We'll also be emailing you a link to the recording as well as the slide deck, which we encourage you to share with your colleagues. So just a quick overview of Harris for those who don't know us. Harris Corporation is a global technology leader providing electronic warfare, avionics, air traffic management, space and intelligence, um, and weather systems to customers in more than 100 countries. The headquarters is based out of Melbourne, Florida, and we have about 17,000 employees worldwide with 7,700 of those being engineers and scientists. So next slide. Within Harris's Space and Intelligent Division is Harris Geospatial Solutions, where Joe and I work. We offer end-to-end -end geospatial solutions from data collection and dissemination to software and technology to custom solutions to help customers solve hard problems and make better decisions. Our flagship software is Envy. Envy is an image processing software suite where you can extract useful information from your data and imagery. We also have Precision Pass, which is a UAV assessment tool to quickly assess your UAV data quality in the field. Jaguar is a geospatial data dissemination and cataloging management system. The geospatial services framework is something that will take all of these awesome tools and put them up in the cloud. IDL is the trusted scientific programming language to extract meaningful visualizations from complex numerical data. And we also have MEGA, our deep learning technology, which works specifically with imagery. Our latest product addition is Helios, which provides fast and accurate real-time ground weather intelligence. Um, the industries that we're serving mainly are defense and intelligence, federal and civil government utilities, precision ag, and transportation, specifically with rail and DOT. So um, moving on, as Harris Geospatial Solutions also offers the largest selection in the world of satellite and aerial imagery, elevation data, LIDAR data, and much more. Additionally, we provide a variety of data-derived products that range from simple image orthorectifications to sophisticated VIS-SIM models. Um, we have a team of production professionals that provide custom solutions and services that meet our client specifications, which Joe is a part of. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Joe. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jody. And uh, let's, let's move on and get this... Get this going. So on a quick agenda slide here, what we're going to be talking about is essentially create DTMs from uh, stereo satellite imagery. So uh, we're going to get into a more technical uh, aspect of that as, as much as possible without getting too deep. Um, but we're also going to be showing a little bit about the photogrammetric workflow that, we'll, that we use and uh, using the stereo environment to articulate the ground features more precisely, why the, why the stereo viewing environment is, is necessary or useful. Uh, and the advantages of adding brake lines to see the automatic point generation, why you would use these uh, yellow lines that you see on the right in that image uh, to make the, uh, the automatic point extraction a little bit more accurate, uh, significantly more accurate actually, 
uh, knowing that the breaks in terrain are being articulated. And then we'll get into a you know an accuracy discussion and a few examples of uh, extraction methods, and then some uh, industry applications and any any questions uh, from that. So let's get going. So creating DTMs from uh, stereo satellite imagery. So the stereo is the key, um, but uh, stereo being any uh, you know set of images uh, or a stereo model, uh, an area collected in the same spot uh, from two different angles, essentially, uh, creates a stereo viewing environment. And the digital terrain models from satellite Im imagery utilize the ephemeris data, you know, the information that is essentially embedded in the positioning metadata of that satellite scene, along with some ground control points uh, to extract terrain elevation values from stereo pairs of two or more overlapping images. So like I said, you need you need two scenes. Um, uh, stereo scenes are, are that which are collected uh, usually the same day uh, uh, from different times, uh, from essentially two different angles. And you're, you're utilizing these different angles to get uh, elevations of any, of any point uh, on that image. So if you look at the, the top of a building and it's in two different spots on the two different images, uh, the software uh, can and the stereo viewing environment uh, enables you to extract a, a height value uh, for that based on that ephemeris data. And that ephemeris data, like I said, is kind of like your your attitude of the sensor in space. You know where it's located, uh, its roll pitch and yaw, a, a whole bunch of uh, parameters like that that uh, account for the accurate uh, location of the of the image seen. So the advantage of, of using satellite imagery, there are other options to create DTMs, uh, like from air photo or UAVs or from LIDAR sources or radar sources. And we'll, we'll go over those in brief, uh, briefly, but uh, we're gonna be dealing with just satellite imagery. And the, the advantage of that is the uh, large area coverage in a single stereo model you know, can, can grab a, a scene of up to 200 square kilometers. So when you, when you purchase a satellite scene, uh, for a given area, it can cover 200 square kilometers, and therefore, um, you know, it's it's very uh, a good way to utilize your you know your your funds and and acquire a large area for your project area. Uh, it also adds the advantage of remote area acquisition. So satellites collect all over the Earth, uh, obviously, uh, unlike you know an airborne sensor where it may be. Uh, problematic to get to uh, far reaches of the earth or areas where they aren't close to an airport even. They may, they may be, you know, in the middle of a continent uh, that you want to collect and that the nearest airport is, is so far away that it just makes it so expensive to get there. So um, having a satellite, you know, be flying around the earth, orbiting around the earth is, is obviously going to be less expensive. Um, and also you have global coverage. So with access to, to archive data. So um, many satellite providers uh, not only can task a, a satellite stereo pair uh, scene collect, but they also have archive data. So um, you can utilize archive data from the past and uh, it may be even cheaper that, and it may be fit your requirements if you are have not as much concern about temporal differentiation if your imagery was collected a year or two ago and it doesn't really matter you're more concerned with um what the, the elevation is at that at that area or the and that dtm collect so let's move on um what the differences between dtms and dsms so digital terrain models obviously are dtms and dsms are digital surface models so if you look at the, the bottom right corner, it's a nice, easy little graphic that kind of shows you uh, the red outline of, those are buildings next to like a mountain. Uh, the red outline shows you the surface, uh, where a surface model is anything you can see from above the earth, essentially. So trees, buildings, cars, anything uh, is considered a part of a DSM, or digital surface, anything that's on the surface. Whereas a DTM is just the terrain. So if the cars, weren't there, it would be part of the terrain. If it was on the ground, anything, essentially that is the ground, um, that isn't man-made, uh, no obstructions essentially. So uh, what 
most people require is that they have uh, an elevation model void of these features, void of trees, void of, of buildings and that kind of thing so that we can get an accurate depiction of what the ground coverage is for that area, uh, you know, for building sites or drainage, uh, all kinds of applications. <clears throat> now, the difficulty comes in in creating a DTM if given a DSM. Um, I mean, there's ways of turning a DSM into a DTM uh, by removing the trees and removing the, the buildings, that kind of thing. Or you can just um, do some pre, pre uh, some pre um, collection of say points and, and lines and, and break lines and that kind of thing in order to just uh, generate a DTM from the ground up, if you will. Uh, so it would only include the ground and not have to remove any any surface features. So that's that's kind of the difficulty is to um, is how to get to that bare earth ground DTM. And so we achieved that, and I'll show you how we we achieve that and how uh, there's different ways of doing that. Now, in any case, you know whether you have a DTM or DSM, um, you know typically some editing is going to be uh, needed either beforehand or after it's generated. Um, even if we, if the best algorithm out there produces a perfect DTM, there's always going to be something in there um, that, that got missed, that the algorithm can't account for, that the, the software can't account for, or that the, maybe the, you know, that the, yeah, that the software can account for. So um, some QAQC may be necessary to get that to the actual ground and editing. Uh, if, if necessary. But the, the goal is, is to try to minimize the amount of editing before or after uh, the elevation model is created. Uh, and so no automatic train extraction method can account for all these surface features perfectly. So it's assumed that a certain amount of editing will be done. To minimize that, um, we have different ways of doing that. So here's an example of what you would expect a surface model and a terrain model to look like. So on the on the right there, you see a terrain model where it's mostly flat. Um, only the, the differences in, in elevation come from uh, earth-like features, or uh, you can see that there's a road with some, um, some bridges that were uh, removed. Um, the way I like to think of a DTM is basically wherever the water flows, that that's uh, that's going to be um, part of the terrain model and void of any uh, man-made features and trees and vegetation, that kind of thing. And then on the left, you see the DSM, which takes everything into account. It'll take into account the trees and the, and the buildings, and, and there's applications necessary for that, of course. You know, I mean, uh, some applications require that you have information about everything that is included in the elevation model. And so uh, different different applications obviously for one or the other. So what we're focusing on here is uh, the bare earth terrain model. So we have this sample area uh, data set. So this uh, is of Juneau, Alaska, and it's a good uh, good representation of problems that can occur. It's a difficult uh, terrain set to work with because um, not only do you have uh, trees and buildings uh, obstructions, but you also have a, a very uh, extreme mountainous terrain that's part of the study area. So in this case, we have an extreme mountain terrain right next to an airport, and we want to make sure that even after we, you know, correct for the imagery or correct for the DTM, the elevation model that it takes into account, that the airport is still located in the right position. Um, you can imagine uh, if you're taking a picture from space, it's two-dimensional, and we're trying to we're trying to mold it into a three-dimensional uh, world and, and geocode it in a three-dimensional way. <clears throat> and so that's um, what we're going to be working with. So on the photogrammetric workflow um, is, is how we get to the point of creating these DTMs. So photogrammetry is the science of deriving spatial measurements from photographs or you know, satellite uh, scenes. Uh, especially for extracting uh, positions of surface points. In, in this case, uh, we're using them from satellite imagery. So what we're doing, we're basically using two uh, satellite scenes. You could, it could be more than two. It could be, you know, a dozen or whatever. Uh, same thing with air photos. It's the 
similar concept, but two or more uh, overlapping scenes uh, making a model. So the the degree of overlap uh, is dependent on you know your acquisition, but and you're you're utilizing the incident angle or the uh, the angle of acquisition and their differences between the two satellite scenes to get elevation values. So in order to make these satellite scenes, which is the basis for creating the DTM more accurate, we would want to collect ground control points. Now it's not mandatory, but it's certainly going to increase the accuracy of the rational polynomial coefficient uh, data that you are given with a satellite scene. The RPC file is the is the file that holds that ephemeris information I briefly spoke of, but it's that information about the attitude of the sensor in space. And so you basically couple couple the RPC data with the with the raw stereo images and it basically locates uh, each stereo scene. And then when you get when you add control points, it, it fine tunes that RPC file. In fact, with the fine tuning of a GCP collection or you know breaks and points, that kind of thing, uh, you can get you can expect to get as much as you know five times better accuracy with the GCPs, uh, simply because you you know a satellite sensor is 600 you know kilometers or miles up in space, uh, uh, variable obviously, and so at that distance, um, you know to accurately locate within you know a meter or two. Uh, of any given pixel is, is pretty difficult. Um, but having the ground control, you're telling uh, the satellite image itself where each uh, position should be. And so additionally from that, not only do we want to properly locate the imagery and kind of refine that rational polynomial coefficient file, the ephemeris data, so that before we run the automatic uh, mass point or the DTM uh, generation, um, we want to we may want to add break lines um, to the imagery, and I'll get into more uh, detail about what the break lines are. But essentially, they're breaks in elevation, uh, so that um, we can you know eliminate uh, the buildings and trees, which are the obvious main concerns for DTM. Uh, construction and uh, we can eliminate those from the equation essentially. So getting a little deeper into what the um, photogrammetry workflow is, you can see uh, here I utilized some not only some ground control points but I also had some LIDAR data that that RGB encoded or color coded uh, LIDAR file you see kind of snaking through this imagery here. Uh, that isn't actually imagery. Those are actually LIDAR points, which are uh, color-coded either from, you know, previous ortho mosaic or uh, at some, you know, some sensors can, uh, you know, just collect um, the RGB values at the same time as collecting the LIDAR points. But in any case, uh, those elevation values from LIDAR were used. Uh, we were also given, you know, some control um, that where survey ground control is typically what uh, what I use. In fact, <clears throat> a typical scenario would be a client is looking for an elevation model in, say, a remote area. Uh, they they send uh, you, you know me and my my colleagues uh, an AOI of the area. I basically say, okay, well, can you go collect some control in these spots, and I'll I'll pinpoint some spots on the imagery as to where they should go collect some ground control maybe even in Google Earth, and they can pull up the, the KMZ in Google Earth and kind of drive to that location, go out there with a, a GPS unit and get an accurate ground control point and then send that ground control back to me uh, if they want to tighten up that solution. But that's another another way uh, of getting uh, control. You can, you can get control off of, like I said, these LiDAR points. You can get control off a of previous or rectified image, maybe with a, a base DEM that you've already created or used from before, that's kind of uh, up to you. But obviously, the more accurate the control I have, the better uh, DTM and overall solution I, we can get uh, get to you. And uh, in addition to, you know, control points, we also might want to, you know, tie the imagery together, obviously, they tie the two scenes. Uh, in this particular circumstance, the, the two scenes overlap almost, uh, almost 100%. 
um, and we're taking it two different times, uh, but you want to try to tie those together as best as possible um, so that in addition to the ground control, locking the images to the ground, the tie points will better lock the images to each other, you know, making sure that the right uh, pixel locations uh, between image sets are, are accurate as well. So in addition to collecting steer, um, GCPs and break lines, we do this in a stereo environment. So it is possible to, you know, collect uh, control and uh, in, you know, a 2D environment, I wouldn't say break lines so much, but um, you, by looking at the same spot, but it's definitely an advantage to using a stereo viewing or looking at it in 3D to get, you know, underneath bridges and uh, at the ground level around tree canopies and that kind of things. Um, so we'll kind of get into that a little bit more, but um, what we want to do is in a stereo viewing environment, collect uh, 3D brake lines. So um, basically any brakes in terrain, and we the stereo ensures that your points and lines are all on the ground, regardless of what could be interfering with that ground visibility. So um, backside of buildings, you know, trees, bridges, uh, anything that is obstructing your view uh, from space or from uh, from an airborne platform. Um, and so you want to um, get around that. And then we can also add GCPs in the stereo. So we know, when I show you what the stereo environment looks like, we know that it is actually on the ground as opposed to uh, roughly on the ground, you know, or um, I can rest assured that my, my view from two different angles uh, will be on the ground as opposed to uh, an X and Y location that assumes a certain ground elevation. Um, so you're getting a more accurate overall control database setup for your uh, eventual DTM uh, collection and derivation from um, the software. Okay, and also obviously auto tie points are also used in that in that uh, situation as well. So if we look at um, this this is an example of a typical stereo scene. I'm just going to kind of flip back and forth, and sometimes, you know, WebEx may not be or go to meetings don't always uh, respond uh, properly. But if you look at the the left and right image, you'll notice the center of the cursor is at the same spot. Um, it's, a, it's a spot in, a, in an opening on a slope uh, by close to some trees. And then you have a building, you'll notice the runway is moving on the right, and you'll notice a big patch on the left that is significantly uh, of different size and uh, location. So what we're doing in a stereo environment is saying, okay, I need to know the height at that crosshair, which is 42 meters in this case. Um, but if I were to move to the left or to the right, um, my that crosshair, that the, the stereo scene would look uh, blurry essentially and so I would collect for that that blurriness or the terrain relief displacement by adjusting the parallax you know, the XY shift in the in the image uh, to be on the ground and so I can see it these buildings in this mountainside will actually pop out at me and I will know that my cursor is not on the ground uh, if I'm if my parallax is not adjusted properly so what I want to do is you properly adjust my parallax so that I know that my cursor is on the ground and that gives me an elevation reading. From that elevation reading, I can then obviously collect a, a control point at that location uh, or, uh, you know, brake lines at that location. So how do we or why would we use brake lines? It's essentially a C point. It's preceding the DTM generation. So the DTM generation itself Yes, it does automatically generate points, um, you know, using an algorithm, but you're seeding it with break lines. You're seeding it with, you know, points or GCPs or tie points, all these different things that make sure that when the automatic and when it fills in the rest of the, of the gaps in between the break lines and in between the GCPs, that those accuracies are, um, are as accurate as they can be. If, if you uh, collect a brake line through a, a forested area, 
uh, the points that are automatically generated around that break line will be at ground level as opposed to at the top of the canopy level. Uh, if you left um, if you left the software to its own devices, it would uh, typically, you know, collect the crown of that uh, of that tree canopy, which in essence is a DSM. And like I said, there's there's uses for that, but uh, we're trying to get to the ground here. And some algorithms, it is possible to uh, eliminate the uh, the tree canopy or account for that, but you can imagine the difficulty. Uh, you know the software would have to get to the ground when it can't see the ground it can't it can't interpolate i mean how is it going to interpolate it is it you know that's it's tricky thing for it to do i'm not saying it's not possible i'm just saying it's very difficult um and taking that out of the equation by manually um collecting a break line from a start and end point uh, it's it's going to be more accurate in my opinion and i'm sure uh, most would agree with me so having these break lines in there are used to see the automatic terrain generation um, period. So, you know, most of the automatic terrain extraction is relatively the same, but adding these C points or these seed lines, these 3D points and these 3D lines essentially uh, guarantees better accuracy to accommodate features uh, for features like trees and buildings to not be included. So by putting these lines there, we know um, that the, the top of a building isn't going to throw off the automatic high point, I mean, I'm sorry, the automatic point extraction engine by being a little bit higher than the ground because the top of the building is throwing, you know, those points off. But by putting a brake line there, even though I can't see behind the building, I can, I know that I can start a, a brake line from a point that I can see, go through the building and finish at a point on the other side that I can see, therefore all the points on, in and around that brake line in place of where that building would be, would be at that exact location as opposed to uh, allowing for the software to, to try and figure out what those uh, points should be underneath that building um, or in place of that building, which can very easily be and in most cases will be affected by not only the building, but also even the uh, the shadow of that building for that matter, or a bridge or uh, you know, a shrubbery versus a tree versus a, you know, medium level of vegetation source or a bridge. Um, I mean, how can you accommodate for every every different type of bridge there is out there, you know? So it's just, it's just tricky. So we get around that by using brake lines and seed points. So here's an example of some brake lines that were collected. Um, you'll notice that the brake lines were collected all around, all around the, um, the runway and all the, the water features, any breaks in terrain. So uh, I'm hoping that at this point you know what, what brake lines are, but a brake line is essentially any difference uh, in, in terrain elevation um, or uh, soft breaks or just uh, maybe, uh, you know, a, a casual break or just a different elevation spot, um, like a rounded, a rounded hill, that kind of thing. Uh, but in any case, if you're basically telling the software what the attitude is like uh, on any given part of the imagery, even if you're you're making redundant um, elevations. Like, um, you know, is the elevation in the middle of that runway going to be different than, um, than, than the side? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's going to be probably a little bit of a crown, but not much. Um, but we've, you know, we've added um, the lines in there anyway. Um, Sometimes it, maybe we don't need this many lines, but it's better to be, you know, safe than sorry. We're, we're adding, you know, just uh, elevations based on anything that uh, that that changes that isn't, uh, you know, man-made or uh, or can it be like. So if you look on the on the mountainside on the left, you can see, you know, some uh, the how the terrain differs, and obviously my my brake lines aren't moving um, because they are two-dimensional in this viewer, but they're actually collected in 3D. So when I would move to the left side, I would again be changing my elevation from 42 meters up to, you know, say 100 meters on the left there, and it would uh, change the um, the stereo imagery underneath. And so therefore, um, I can get elevations of each of those brake lines more efficiently. 
And these brake lines are uh, collected underneath the, the tree canopy here. And um, it, it's not, it, it is a, you know, a, a little bit of a, a skill to be able to see in stereo, not everyone can, uh, or see in stereo accurately, um, but you're, you're still gonna be able to get to the ground based on, um, you know, open spots or knowing how, how high the vegetation is there, you can offset it and, and get to the, the bottom, the base of the imagery if, if you really need to. But um, the bottom line is, is we're, we're, we're telling the software what those um, elevations are based on, on, on starting points and, you know, ground locations and interpolating uh, visually and manually to get more accurate results. So here's an example of the sample area that we are using here, draped over the multispectral imagery. Typically, I'll use the, the panchromatic imagery uh, from satellite scenes because they have higher resolution. Your typical uh, panchromatic satellite scene is, is half a meter to one and a half meters, uh, give or take, <clears throat> whereas your multispectral is usually you know, two to four times uh, degraded from that matter. So you, this is probably, you know, two or four meter uh, multispectral imagery as opposed to the, the half meter panchromatic and more accurate uh, black and white, uh, for lack of a better word, um, imagery that is, allows for me to collect in a more accurate manner. So you can see the airport and the, and the, the mountain along the side. And so this, from this, um, we can uh, generate a digital terrain model, um, and it will actually calculate mass points in between these break lines. So here's kind of an overlay of, of the break lines collected from a refined RPC data set. The break lines have been with control, but you'll notice how the, the raw basic geocoded RPC information image below is offset. Um, that's just because the, the rational polynomial coefficient uh, file, the ephemeris information, the attitude of the sensor information that comes with an image scene is not, is not very accurate. Um, in fact, uh, most uh, DTM or DSM um, algorithms out there will claim about five to you know, 10 times um, less accuracy if not using you know, a, GP, a GCP refined uh, output. So I can expect to um, lock my uh, my break lines and lock my image down a lot better with control, so that my um, so that my break line and my DTM is going to be much more accurate. Uh, but typically, you're looking uh, anywhere from around you know two to five meter shift potentials, uh, with the Z being off you know anywhere from also two to five maybe. Uh, meters uh, just using the raw RPCs, but it all depends on the area and how much uh, terrain relief displacement there is. In this case, we have a big mountain right there, so that's a lot of terrain relief. And so we have to basically warp what is essentially a, a two-dimensional or a flat image into a three-dimensional space. So pixels have to push and pull, you know, have to be relocated, and we're essentially utilizing that uh, that parallax or that shift or that terrain relief displacement in order to get accurate uh, locations for any given pixel and any given elevation from those pixels uh, from any image set. And this is just, again, a, a close-up of how that is offset um, from, the, uh, from the, the actual imagery. And here's a side-by-side a -side comparison of a 2D environment that's viewing the um, uh, the drawing file, which uh, on the left and then uh, on the right is again our, our standard uh, stereo viewing environment. Sometimes I'll even use the uh, 3D grid that you see in the top right corner there. So that's the break lines in like a, um, I shouldn't call it a grid because it's not a grid, in a, in a vector viewing or a wireframe mesh. That would be a better definition of what you're looking at there. And it just kind of verifies that you can see my crosshair is halfway up the slope or, uh, and it's sitting right on top of that break line, which means I'm on the ground. 
and the image tells me that I'm on the ground um, in stereo. And so I, it just, it's another check that I have that all these points and lines are, are gonna be on the ground. These break lines are gonna be on the ground uh, around a given feature. And so the, the purpose of having them in the 2D environment, in a, in a drawing environment, uh, like MicroStation or AutoCAD, for that example, um, is you can make edits. So I can, I can uh, these will be synced up. So anywhere I move in the stereo viewer on the right, uh, will actually move the cursor on the left, and I can see if the, at any given point uh, along that line, any of those lines, I can make changes to remove or uh, make changes to edits to. So um, th that's where I, I do my QA, QC checks or add my break lines uh, in, in a stereo viewing environment. <clears throat> so the workflow here would be really simply um, make sure I'm on the ground, uh, turn on my 3D polyline uh, collection uh, tool, start collecting in in a 3D viewer, and it'll show up, and you'll see it um, drawing on the left as well as on the right, and then I finish, and then you have a drawing file with 3D, uh, 3D break lines, uh, 3D vectors. So there's a, more of a a view of what the editing environment looks like. So uh, again, I've got that kind of wireframe mesh view at the top right, kind of looking up the side of the mountain. I've got a vector selected, a break line selected, and you can see all the nodes that that break line is comprised of. Uh, I also have a small area of points that were uh, generated automatically from those break lines um, that I can uh, view any given value of. Um, it may, may be hard to see, but uh, wherever my cursor is in this left view, I have a 21.5582 elevation value um, for whatever one it happens to be selected on. Uh, and it's and the, the location. So if I wanted to, I could, you know, remove those points or move them or, you know, change them or interpolate them or uh, whatever I might want to do. I might, might need to add, a, you know, more break lines or less in certain areas. Um, just to make sure that my points are, are looking good. And I've actually turned off the mass point uh, file on the right. You'll see in the little chip viewer down below here, uh, bottom left-hand corner, that those mass points are actually on, um, but you wouldn't be able to see the imagery at this zoom level uh, if they were on. So uh, sometimes I'll, I'll turn the points off, make sure that all the break lines uh, look good and then I'll turn the points back on and zoom in and make sure that they're actually on the ground and they are respective of where the break lines are, which, um, which they are. All right, so then there's the mass point collection. So again, we're looking at that wireframe mesh uh, visualization on top here and on the bottom right image here, you have um, the overview scene in a little chip viewer and you see the mass points collected. The mass points, um, are collected with the project information like the GCP collection and the uh, refined RPC information. Uh, and those are collected automatically from the stereo image pairs. So basically you're feeding the terrain extraction engine um, refined RPC information, so better ephemeris information, the better location of where those satellite scenes are based on you know, what those GCPs are locking it down to as well as a break line. So we're giving it all this break line and GCP information for it to now give me a more accurate location of all these points, all these millions of points in between these break lines. So I, I'm assured that you know all the points will be on the ground below the, the canopy, void of, of buildings, uh, because that's what I'm, I'm looking for. Now, similar is true uh, with contours in that increasing the interval doesn't necessarily uh, increase the accuracy. I guess I should have uh, specified first that the, the is, is a limitation on the resolution of the imagery. So, I mean, you can't expect to get an accurate, you know, one year a DTM from, uh, you know, a Landsat scene or, like a, you know, a 15 or 30 meter pixel. You know, you're just not going to get the accuracy. Um, the same thing is with contours. The contours are actually generated from the DTM, so it's just a function of how close your pixel spacing is. So 
uh, you might want to try and get a, a better contour with a half meter contour from five meter data, but uh, from one you know point to the next, you know, it can be off more than a meter or two because of the of the resolution of that DTM. You know, um, that's where you might want to consider a different a different airborne source like um, like airborne aerial imagery um, and that kind of thing. Um, so DTM mass point accuracy, like I said, is a function of the refined RPCs and the break lines. So what we can do is we can actually not only refine those RPCs, but we can also uh, actually deliver our refined RPC as a product if, if someone wants that. So if we, by utilizing these control points, we can basically make the accuracy of this, this satellite ephemeris data more accurate we, by using um, GCPs and, and the like uh, control points and that kind of thing. So that actually could be a, a deliverable if that's someone wanted. So here's just an example of, again, that runway area and the water and the surrounding area and a bunch of the brake lines that were collected, uh, soft brakes and hard brakes, um, depending on you know what you're doing will depend on how, how tight uh, you want those, those brake lines. Um, and then here's the mass point generation from that. So you can see there's a lot of points still that that need to be uh, generated aside from just the brake lines. But if you look at any given spot like this, this brake line here that uh, was generated, um, that was collected to ensure that the buildings are not interfering with the, the DTM generation. And we just put lines there uh, so that the the point collection will be on the ground. It will not include any buildings, any trees, any bridges, any you know uh, features that are essentially man-made. Here's another example of of again that 3D mesh environment. Um, so if you drape that over the the stereo imagery, here's some ridge lines that were collected, and then even even the the drainage patterns that go down um, that. A tree canopy, and this is from satellite imagery. This is this is probably a, an eight meter product or a five meter product. Um, with satellite imagery, it's hard to get you know better than that, even from an automated source. Uh, actually, an automated source is, is no doubt going to be um, uh, much higher than that uh, of a resolution uh, output or post spacing of that DTM output. Um, so. Just wanted you to see, you know, some of the points. And that's not all the points necessarily. It depends on the zoom level. Uh, actually, yeah, that probably is all the points. But so let's move on to the accuracy discussion. I'm kind of getting a little long-winded here. I'm trying not to uh, try to get this um, get to the uh, accuracy part of this. So um, the accuracy of the RPC files themselves uh, that accompany the raw solid imagery must first be considered. You know, as a as a as your output will be a reflection of that control and that RPC information that is used, along with the the break lines, of course. But um, so we want to make sure that our, our RPC data is dialed in as close as we can get it, and that our control is helping you know the the stereo pairs be as accurate as we can get it, and that we add some break lines so that we uh, don't have to let the software decide what to do with tree canopies and bridges and and that kind of thing. So um, the more work we can do on the front end is going to exponentially, you know, increase the accuracy on the back end. So keep that in mind. Um, and so if we get to the actual values, you know, most specifications will call for like a five times better uh, with or without GCPs. You know, if you are using GCPs, you're going to be five times more accurate. If, if you're expecting to get a two meter uh, DTM product uh, off the shelf or, you know, from a uh, from a vendor, um, then you can expect that accuracy to be uh, five times better if you have, if they are using ground control. Uh, if not, it will be uh, a 10 meter accuracy. You know, it'll be uh, that much farther off. But perhaps that's that's good enough for you. Uh, that all depends on what your your application is. So I'm not I'm not here to judge, but I, I do want to try and show that there is a difference that um, these accuracies from automation uh, can provide. <clears throat> and relying on automation um, does, you know, it can be very successful, but I just can't see how you can be as accurate uh, without brake lining and GCP collection. 
Um, and in fact, you can expect, you know, one, one and a half to two meter vertical accuracy with GCPs from say half meter pixels, even closer to, you know, like a one meter uh, vertical accuracy, I, I hazard yes to say. Whereas you'd get, you know, 10 meters without GCPs uh, and relying just on the rational polynomial coefficient law. So if we, we kind of go back to that, that view of the, the raw imagery with just the basic RPC information without any kind of corrections, you can see how far you know, off uh, in the X and Y direction any pixel can be, especially if you've got, you know, terrain loop displacement, if you've got mountains or even, you know, slopes or, or what have you. But uh, if you're if you're in the middle of a desert, yeah, I can, I can claim I can get you, you know, <laughs> two meter, you know, or at least you know, three or four meter accuracy without any kind of control at all because it's flat, it's not moving. You know, your, your DTM isn't going to budge much. Um, in a vertical accuracy, at least. So you're you're going to get definitely get better accuracy in flat areas, but it's when you get into the the slopes of it, um, that you uh, should be concerned, you know. And that is mitigated by this break line at. So we're we're correcting for these um, offsets and these slopes by adding break lines. And the nice thing is we can claim just as just as accurate on these slopes because of that. Um, whereas with an algorithm approach, you have to be careful that um, you can actually get that. Uh, that the, the claims are true that they can get within the same accuracy uh, slopes or not. There's a lot of caveats and, and a lot of different uh, applications and things and but uh, with, our, with our solutions it's, it's not a caveat it's just uh, it is what we can achieve because um, we are getting to the ground to begin with as opposed to getting to the ground later on. Um, and then obviously utilizing that stereo environment allows uh, for us to see where that ground is and getting to the ground uh, for GCP collection and for break line addition. So here's some examples. Uh, I have uh, an IFSTAR radar image with five meter posting. Um, it's going to be a little bit, a little bit, um, well, you'll see here in a second. And then uh, DTM from five meter imagery that we collected. So we basically took, you know, our, uh, I think it's one meter or half meter worldview uh, data and generated a five meter product. Uh, it is potentially possible to go maybe a little bit better than that, um, but I think you'll see uh, the results are actually pretty staggering um, at how uh, accurate a five meter posting can, can actually provide. And then LIDAR, which was collected at one meter posting. So I'd expect, obviously, you know, five times more, you know, information or at least higher information from the LIDAR collect. And I think you'll see that it's pretty, pretty similar once you get between the, the five meter um, stereo collect and the one meter LIDAR. So here's the radar, uh, IFSTAR collection. You know, there's quite a bit of noise and, and terrain. Right away, you can see the difference. If I kind of skip back and forth between these two, you can see that um, I've got a, a flattened area. I can definitely pull out the features of this this road much better, and it did it did collect an account for you know this uh, this highly treed area that is actually also happens to be on on a ridge uh, or you know a bankment. You can see that, that sticks out quite predominantly in here. And the river, uh, the information along that river edge is is void of trees, whereas here it's hard to see what's really going on. And then if we skip forward to the, the LIDAR collect, yes, we do have a lot more information, but I also have a lot of building information still in here uh, that I don't want, you know. Um, even the this this ridge here is not quite as pronounced. Uh, this This white is basically showing a different elevation where it, like, I don't know what the value is, but say we're at 20 meters above sea level as opposed to like 10 or 5. You know, the difference is it's quite negligible. Um, well, I, I shouldn't say that because I can see that there's a definitely big difference between that area and what the, you know, the LIDAR source in this case it happens to be uh, generalizing. So that's a little uh, shocking that that difference isn't pointed out in here. But anyway, um, LIDAR. DTM, radar, DTM, LIDAR. Another example, again, this one's uh, of the same data set, um, just a different color 
uh, combinations, uh, just so you can kind of see the features more. Uh, here's a different example of a 30 meter ramped elevation, and then uh, you know a, a nice easy eight meter product. Even the eight meter product, you can see the difference between you know some of these roads that are coming in here. These are uh, flat you know fields. Some of them are actually close to underwater. Uh, in fact, these blue ones are lower than sea level. Um, and um, but I think it gives you a good example as to all the the difference that even a, a custom solution, even though um, you know you're at an eight meter DEM, when you're collecting the edge of a forest, for example, uh, and you're right at that elevation, that that's no longer you know eight meters in vertical discrepancy. It's actually on the ground. You know, it, it'll be plus or minus a meter. At any given point, but you can rest assured that um, the accuracy is going to be much tighter than than, than simply the eight meter posting that it represents. So, just some some final thoughts here on some applications that uh, it can be used for. So, mining, you know, uh, obviously mining is a big one because uh, we need to see any surface materials that are moved and and created, and uh, we can do this anywhere in the world. Uh, it's again where the whole um, advantage of satellite image acquisition is I don't have to have a, an airborne solution in there and I can just uh, collect the same area over and over again larger area bigger scene um, and mining is a great example of that same thing with uh, you know reclamation Bureau of reclamation uses satellite imagery as well as, as you know airflows sometimes oil and gas exploration again comes remote areas or uh, large areas and you're trying to get a, a general overview um, but also, uh, with the accuracy you need to, to get uh, information from construction verification, verification. This is more like larger construction sites. A smaller construction site, you might want to be a little lower flying, a little higher resolution in order to get uh, some a little bit finer detail and finer accuracies. But certainly, um, larger construction sites, you can you can grab um, uh, you know some good DTMs, especially with a break line. <clears throat> Urban planning, you know, urban sprawl, obviously, hydro planning, hydrologic, you know, planning dams, you know, one of the main things is is where the where the water's gonna flow is what these uh, DTMs are, are utilized for. If you got trees in the way, obviously the water's not gonna flow over a tree, but uh, we need to know, you know, what's in the ground, what's around, what's going on. Uh, void of buildings, void of trees to, to get uh, good hydro planning. Uh, transportation, same thing, you know, we need to make sure wherever the water flows that it's not going to impact the uh, not going to impact the the ground around it. Um, I mean the, the the surface that the pavement is on and that kind of thing and bridges and all that kind of fun stuff. Energy applications, geology, geothermal activities, and hydro lines and you know transmission lines, utilities, all that kind of fun stuff to to get into areas where uh, where maybe you know we haven't been before or remote areas. Um, uh, so yeah so hopefully that gives you a good overview uh, it's a little bit more information on how the the DTMs are, are different from DSMs and why you know brake lining and, and refining the RPCs that come straight off the satellite uh, has a, a more accurate advantage uh, if you need that and the, how you're seeding you know your mass point production of the DTM creation with break lines, with GCPs, and with those refined RPCs for a, a better than what you can expect um, uh, product. We like to under promise and over deliver. So you rest assured that uh, the, the accuracies that you're looking for and what we acclaim is what you are getting, if not better. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jody and uh, just so she can type some loose ends and um, Thank you for your time. Great. Thanks, Joe, for the in-depth presentation. Um, so we just have a couple minutes for Q&A. If you have a question, just enter it into the questions chat box. Um, so let's just get started. The first question is, is there a limit for point tie points, or the more the better? Um, it depends. Uh, some tie point collection engines, you know, are um, two-dimensional and some are three-dimensional. If you end up utilizing a lot of three-dimensional tie points, the tie points you generate can sometimes you know, negatively affect the actual solution. 
So in that case, you want to keep them low. Uh, if your tie points are just an X and Y uh, tie point collection, uh, automatically, then um, the more the merrier on that because you're, you're you're locking down everything with the GCPs and you're biasing everything towards GCPs and not the tie points. So uh, it's a function of that, I would say. Um, for most areas, your control is the most important, and then uh, you know five to ten times out of your control in tie points would be would be fine. Uh, if you put thousands and thousands of tie points, your solution is your solution is not going to be uh, that much better. Great. The next question: Are you using the lidar contour as break lines? Uh, no, no. The um, the contour file actually is generated from the DTM file. So um, the most softwares out there will actually just uh, generate a contour file from a grid or a, a point file. So it goes through and it, it, it generates a contour uh, line by itself uh, based on the, you know, the elevation values from the DTM. And so that's where the contour lines come from. Uh, a LIDAR source is a separate way of collecting an elevation uh, model, uh, which it too is, generates a contour line file from the points. So um, the contour file is not actually all that complicated. It's basically just uh, relaying the information of what the DTM has given you for every point in, in, a, in a form of ISO lines along the, along the DTM. Hope that helps. Great. Um, in your opinion, is it necessary to atmospherically correct a stereo pair before producing an elevation surface model? Uh, not with the way we do it. Uh, if you're running, you know, a DTM or in essence, actually a DSM uh, based on imagery from on stereo imagery automatically without collecting brake lines or, or ground control, uh, yeah, the, the algorithm will, will be could be affected by atmosphere, you know, problems, uh, refraction, atmosphere uh, um, values. But since we're collecting brake lines, the atmospheric constituents don't really, you know, come into play because we're locking the lines down to the ground based on what we visually see. And then the automatic point extraction engine um, will fill in the blanks based on our brake line. So it won't matter. It's not going to have an atmospheric problem for that point on that point collection because of the atmosphere. It'll be because of a feature that's in the image. Um, clouds can cause a concern, obviously, but um, uh, with a cloud with a cloud in the way or in a cloud in a satellite scene, you may need to get an additional area to collect for that. or we can actually do a pretty good job of interpolating uh, in between and underneath clouds if the, if the terrain isn't too isn't too wild and crazy in that area, and it actually works out pretty good. So that's actually another another advantage that I didn't mention uh, with that algorithm approach a DTM collection. Uh, it doesn't account for what happens under a cloud, where as I if I have clouds on the top of a an area, if it's flat or not flat, I can interpolate for the most part from one side of the cloud to the other side of the cloud, and you know, the accuracy will be a little off, obviously, but uh, it's still going to be something that is generated automatically. So hope that helps. All right. So we are at the top of the hour, and we have a lot of questions. So what we're going to do is um, pull together a Q&A sheet, and when we send out the recording and the slide deck in the next couple of days, we'll just include that as well for everybody. Um, so thank you for everybody's attention on the line, and thanks, Joe, for the great presentation. Um, hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you for showing up.